So let me welcome all of you who managed to enter the room uh, to the first in a new series of talks from the School of Complex Adaptive Systems at ASU. The series, as you can see here, is, is entitled Making Sense of Complexity. And the information here is for our next event in two weeks on February 26th, same time, where our very own Jaffa Applegate will talk about complexity economics in the context of global futures. Now, the purpose of this series is to introduce our colleagues uh, to the faculty that, that currently makes up the brand new School of Complex Adaptive Systems to give you an overview of what we are doing and to encourage future conversations and collaborations uh, between complexity scholars and the rest of the university, but also, of course, specifically within the College of Global Futures. Uh, I'm Manfred Laubichler. Uh, many of you will uh, know me or of me, and I'm currently the director of the school. And so with this first talk, uh, I would like to uh, take it uh, give you some introduction about the rationale behind the school, as well as identify some future challenges in complex adaptive system science that we will be pursuing in the context of the new school. Complexity in the context of global futures. That in a way conjures up the idea uh, of Walter Benjamin about uh, the angel of history. Uh, which basically tells us that while mo ma mainly we are focused in our scientific orientation at the past, at the same time we are propelled towards the future, can't escape the future, and are mostly blind towards the future. Correcting that view of the angel of history is a major role and a major goal uh, of complex adaptive systems in the context of global futures. What are we talking specifically here? There is a challenge. And the challenge is that we currently have entered the Anthropocene. You all know about the idea of the Anthropocene, that it is a new geological epoch char characterized by the fact uh, that we as the human species are now the most powerful geological force shaping everything and all systems across the whole planet. Now, as we are in the Anthropocene, one question to ask is how did we get there? And that immediately uh, points to the fact that we could only enter the Anthropocene because of a very complex and very long co-evolutionary history between our species, our technologies, our societies and the rest of the planet. So uncovering the causes as well as the future of the Anthropocene is a major part of global futures. There's an urgency to do this because as part of the Anthropocene, as part of the becoming the major geological force on this planet, we are right now shaping and engineering our planet at global scales. With the consequence, that uh, we have to diagnose that uh, humankind is no longer in a safe operating space. We just have to turn on the news and there are all kinds of uh, crises uh, one after the other. And it's not only environmental crisis or the climate crisis, it's also the social crisis uh, because they are intrinsically part of that complex systems that we created and that we part of. And, uh, that we are shaping, but increasingly no longer controlling. And so we left a safe operating space, uh, which basically leads us to what are we going to do about this? All those challenges uh, that I mentioned and the fact that we are giving this talk in this current format reflects one of those challenges we are facing, namely the current pandemic, uh, just means that we are living in an environment where the complexity of the systems are generating a new category of risk. It's often referred to as systemic risk. Now a systemic risk is a category of risk that is intrinsic in the systems dynamic and that cannot really be anticipated and managed in the traditional way. 
uh, to give you an example what that means. Traditional risks, you can get insurance for. Global systemic risks, we don't know how to insure. Who would, how would you have anticipated creating an insurance contract against a global pandemic? It's simply not possible. So that means we have to find new ways of dealing with this category of risk, which is a consequence of the dynamics of complex systems. So our contribution to this is that uh, we uh, propose that what is needed is a new scientific understanding uh, to meet those challenges. The whole framework of global futures at ASU is designed to accomplish that. And within that framework, it should be come obvious by now, and I will explain a little further, that complex adaptive system is a core component. So this is the, an overview of the role of complexity within global futures. Several of you have seen probably one or the other version of this uh, graphic at some point when you uh, were exposed to the idea of global futures at ASU. It's sort of a graphic representation of the architecture uh, I won't run through all of the elements here. You can uh, go to the website if you're not familiar with this. But basically, global future is an orientation for the whole university. Um, it's organized in five different spaces that uh, enc encompass some of the more traditional functions of the university and some that are sort of more ASU specific. It has a learning and discovery space, which is sort of traditional research and education. It has a focus on solution. It has a focus of engagement with the larger community. It's not that we are sort of passive provider of knowledge and then somebody else needs to do something with it. We are actively promoting that. We are engaging with various publics. And we do that, of course, not alone, but in the context of large national and international networks. Uh, there are several themes. Uh, focal areas, as they are called, that focus on various dimensions. Uh, but then within it, within that Global Futures Laboratory, uh, we also have the new College of Global Futures. And the College clearly connects to all five of those spaces. Uh, it captures the traditional learning and research spaces, but of course also the others. And the col College is composed of three different schools and the School of Sustainability, which uh, is captured here by the idea of sustainable transformations, the School for the Future of Innovations in Society, which captures sort of the innovation dynamics on a very broad scale that are necessary to accomplish that, and the School of Complex Adaptive Systems, which basically connects all those various themes because they are all expressions of complex systems. Now, the way it was uh, conceptualized is here with the founding st statement here. It was established as a foundational institution within the new college. What do we mean by foundational institutions? Well, every problem that is that you can possibly think about in this context is ultimately a complex systems problem. So in that sense, complex systems is both the foundational basic science for global future, but it also has, of course, an important role to play uh, in shaping the application domains and the solution domains of global futures. Um, for those of you who have been at ASU for a while, uh, you realize that a school of complex adaptive systems did not come out of nowhere. Rather, it uh, is the product of a long, several, almost 15 to 20 year old effort, concentrated effort at ASU uh, to establish research domains that focus on, comp on the study of complex systems. Most recently, many of those research centers were uh, integrated within the Global Biosocial Complexity Initiative. Um, and uh, that initiative also uh, manages ASU's very close collaboration with the Santa Fe Institute. And that collaboration is also the one that will greatly affect the future development of the school. Now, what do we mean by complex systems in the school of complex adaptive systems? Uh, a statement that any problem that is relevant and of interest is ultimately a complex systems problem and can be seen as both grandiose, uh, shallow, 
uh, and meaningless uh, unless we specify exactly what we mean by that. So complex system science for us is basically a common language and framework. It is a way of thinking and knowing and it, is a, and it requires a certain set of skills that allows us to address those problems. And then there are two, two sets of skills. There's the skill of understanding complex systems, and then there is the skills that are necessary to apply a complex systems approach to a particular domain, whether it is an environmental domain, a social domain, a technological domain. So in that sense, complex adaptive system is sort of the prime science for ASU as it tries to be a very inter and transdisciplinary institution. And that is also how Michael Crow sees it. And that's why he is quite happy that we have established that new school. Now, before we get into the future, let me briefly review how we got uh, to complex adaptive system science in 2021. So a very brief history of complex system science. We can identify a prehistory period, uh, which for all intensive purposes covers the whole uh, time span from Aristotle to the 20th century. Um, the reason why I brought up Aristotle here is that he was actually the one who had a very comprehensive and sophisticated conception of causality. Namely, he thought that there are at least four causes that you need to consider to understand any natural phenomenon. And the relationship between those four Aristotelian causes can be seen as one of the first models of how to think about complex systems. But let's not get distracted about that. I could go on with this forever, as you might well imagine. In the 20th century, beginning of the 20th century uh, to about uh, the 1970s or so, you had several more formal attempts that uh, to create something that eventually would become complex system science. You had uh, scientific endeavors such as general system theory, information theory, cybernetics, the emerging computational sciences and the like. Again, lots to be said about this, but those were all attempts at a synthesis uh, that captures one or the other of the relevant domains which eventually would become complex adaptive system science. In the 1980s, uh, complex system science really emerged as an idea and as a practice. And it had a lot to do with the establishment of the Santa Fe Institute. There were ongoing discussions starting in the late 1970s throughout the early 1980s um, that tried to bring those various streams of research together under a new umbrella, which eventually would become complex adaptive system science. And uh, it uh, led to the formation of SFI uh, in 1984. Now, once we have some kind of a founder event, uh, complex adaptive system science pretty much followed the path uh, that uh, Gunther Stent, a famous uh, molecular biologist, uh, described as the history of molecular biology. Namely, it uh, had some clearly distinguishable three phases. The first phase following Sten's terminology uh, was a kind of a romantics phase where uh, the, it was the discovery of a wide open world. New ideas came at rapid pace, new venues opened up. That pretty much characterized the 1980s to the 1990s at Santa Fe and beyond, of course. It was followed similar to the history of molecular biology by something that Stent referred to as a dogmatic phase. Once you have established a new domain of knowledge and a new way of looking at the world, of course, uh, those practitioners then uh, feel compelled to define an identity. And identity often has something to do with dogma. So in the, in the early 2000s, I would say, complex adaptive system science has entered its dogmatic phase where a certain set of key concepts hardened and were defended as a particular view uh, of complex adaptive system science. And you begin to see uh, a kind of friction between uh, other scientific endeavors. Of what is this thing called complex adaptive system science? How is it related to 
and a variety of other uh, scientific endeavors and the like. A dogmatic phase uh, is, uh, was then followed similar to uh, the molecular biology again by what's called the academic phase. Uh, the academic phase basically means a consolidation and an execution of a paradigm. Uh, you can also characterize this as the phase where I too have a complex adaptive system. So the reality that com complex systems can be found everywhere and the complex systems methodology therefore can be applied in a variety of the domains characterize that phase. It also, as we all know, typical academic behavior dictates us to behave. Uh, it leads to a certain type of fragmentation within complex adaptive system science uh, following either problem-based lines in different disciplines, whether it's economics, whether it's the life sciences, whether it's technology, um, or different methodologies. It's all about networks, it's all about agent-based models, it's all about computation and information theory. So you get different sects within complex adaptive system science. Now, the question for the future then is the following. Are we continuing uh, in a traditional academic phase or are we actually rebooting the whole endeavor of complex adaptive systems and sort of entering a new romantic phase where we sort of conquer new opportunities, conquer new spaces, conquer new lands. And I would argue, fortunately, we are at the beginning of a new romantic phase because there is now a set of new challenges confronting complex adaptive system science that forces it or leads it to undergo a kind of transformation and revolution itself. So what are those dimensions of complexity uh, that lead to a reorientation of complex adaptive system science? And those are actually the dimensions that uh, we have been defining uh, for the establishment of the new school and they will be unfolding as the school actually grows, hires new faculty and begins its operations. And many of those dimensions and actually three major dimensions are deeply connected with the challenge of global future. So the first of those dimension has to do with history and evolution. So how do complex systems transition from the past into the future? And that gets us back to Benjamin's angel of history that rather than looking backwards and trying to then see the future as a simple extrapolation of the past, we have to actually look into both directions and understand the complex dynamics and transformations of those systems. If we care about having global futures, that is an essential component. And it has several technical implications in terms of new mathematics that we need, new methodological approaches that we need, um, merging on a theoretical level, evolutionary theory with complexity theory in a meaningful way, um, and all of that that follows. So I'll give you some examples of what we're doing in that um, domain in a moment. The third dimension, uh, the second dimension, has to do with function broadly. And uh, here the guiding question is how do complex systems adapt and fail? Now that is to some degree uh, a, a dimension that has been quite active from the very beginning of complex adaptive system science with one additional caveat. There has not been paid equal attention to failure or why do systems fail than to trying to understand how system can adapt and function. And what we will actually focus here in the new school is systematically also explore how complex systems fail because we need to understand the conditions of failure if you want to design sustainable interventions into the future. So this is an important part uh, of the mission of the new school. And uh, the third dimension has to do with scale and particularly with scale in our current moment uh, and into the future. Uh, there is the, a concept uh, was recently introduced um, about the complexity crisis. 
And the complexity crisis has, has actually two dimensions in the context of global futures. On the one hand, we get a complexity crisis because of an increase in scale. So systems grow, they become more interconnected, they become more complex and interdependent. And once they fail, we see the problem. Need I remind everybody that um, COVID is not just a virus, it is a big social, economic, technological disruptor. So it's a complete system failure in, in many respects. So that's the one dimension of the complexity crisis. What happens with the increased complexity? At the same time, we get a decrease in scale and that is a decrease in the temporal scale because we have less and less time to intervene into those unfolding problems. So the complexity crisis is basically the tension between increasing complexity in one dimension and decrease in the time we have to actually do something about those uh, problems. And that is sort of the third major conceptual axis uh, that we are focusing on in this school. Now, with those three dimensions, I'm very optimistic that we are actually entering what Stent would call a new romantic phase in the uh, history of complex adaptive system science, because those are challenges that have not really be systematically explored over the last 40 years or so of complex adaptive systems thinking. Now, let's make this sort of concrete in terms of how we need a complex systems approach and how it shapes many other areas of science. There is a general way of how we can sort of map methodologically and epistemology a lot of what we are doing in the scientific enterprise. So generally, we uh, start by trying to understand the elements of a system. And you can call this as successful descriptions and series of microstates. Those are the parts of the systems. And then we have the system behavior, which we often refer to as emergent behavior and systems dynamic. So we can observe this and we, get, we collect data about systems behavior, which gives us descriptions about macrostates of the system. And what we wish for is that we could simply map from our understanding of the parts to our understanding of the emergent behavior. If that actually works, then we have some very elegant uh, formal, formalized theories in science. And it works in some cases. It works in e economics. Uh, it works in evolutionary theory, for instance, where you, you have some very successful cases where we can map from molecular to phenotypic evolution. So far, so good, except it works as long as it doesn't. And uh, most likely, Mo the phenomena that are truly interesting or that are truly important for understanding global futures are the ones where this simple mapping assumption simply does not, no longer work. So what do we do about it? So if we stick with our model here, if we don't have a simple mapping assumption, that means what else do we have to do? We need to understand how to translate what we can observe as, as parts of a system and emergent behavior of a system. And in order to get a comprehension of that, we need to understand what's in between. And those are complex systems transformations. So that's the role of complex adaptive system science. In economics, for instance, we see over the last several decades, a progression of theoretical approaches that go away from the simple assumption of an elegant mathematics of a rational actor and optimization to actually accounting for the reality of what humans actually do when they enter in economic activity. And so you have complexity economics, behavioral economics, or most recently narrative economics um, that are all trying to understand what actually goes on inside of those complex system that makes up economic activity. In and Next, and the talk in two weeks by Joffa Applegate will deal with some of those uh, assumptions and some of those complex systems transformations that we need to uh, 
understand in order to understand economics. Now, in evolutionary biology, we have an actually very successful way of uh, mediating between mic microstates and macrostates. And that has to do with developmental evolution, which is now you know, an exercise for the last 50 years or so, where we try to understand not just genes as atoms and then say, we can map from a gene to a phenotype, but rather look at the complexities of the interactions between those genes as they affect the development of organisms. So there are ways how we can actually get at complex systems transformation. The question is, what are the complex systems transformations that we need to understand in the context of global futures? So that is sort of the, the big research challenge for the new school of complex adaptive systems. So let's make this now less abstract and somewhat more concrete. Um, by uh, reviewing a few of the projects that uh, my lab is currently engaged in. And uh, as the series unfolds, you will hear more examples from other members of the school about their own research, which then gives you sort of a picture of what we are doing. Now, thinking in terms of uh, the Anthropocene uh, and how we get from the past into the future, one interesting phenotype And that is basically the exponential growth in many socioeconomic as well as earth systems parameters over the last 70, 80 years or so. And uh, it's often referred to in an iconic way uh, by this table tableau here of hockistic graphs. Whatever you look at, whatever you want to measure, you see exponential growth or more or less exponential growth. And in some cases, hyper exponential growth. Okay, so this is a diagnosis of a phenomenon. This is sort of an emergent phenotype. How can we explain what actually goes on there? Not the least in order to try to figure out how to stop some of the immediate crashes that you can anticipate if you look at all those uh, exponential growth curves. How can we prevent some of those? And to that end, uh, we are studying um, the great acceleration. And we are studying with a, the great acceleration with a variety of methods. Our first approach uh, was done by applying scaling analysis, simply asking the phenotype, the emergent pattern of, the, a pattern of those exponential growths are of course driven by the activities of individuals. So what is the relationship between the number of individuals to those parameters? This is sort of the principle of a scaling analysis. And when we did this, uh, we found some intriguing novel phenomena. Traditionally, when you look at scaling analysis, you distinguish between two types of scaling. Uh, sublinear scaling, where the scaling coefficient uh, is smaller than one, which is basically an economy of scale, familiar to all biologists, for instance, in terms of metabolic scaling, that larger organisms are more efficient, energy efficient than smaller organisms, for instance. Um, or you have superlinear scaling, uh, where the scaling coefficient is larger than one, which is what we observe in terms of social systems such as cities um, and in, uh, or social dynamics in generally. But generally the scaling coefficient here uh, that we empirically find is about 1.15 or thereabouts. But what this means is that basically it, it gives us uh, a positive scaling effect. Examples for this include, for instance, um, larger cities are more innovative than smaller cities if you count the number of patents or other measures of economic output, for instance. Larger cities are also have more crime. So you have the, the good and the bad sort of in the same kind of scaling relationship. But what we found in terms of the, uh, uh, and by the way, there is a, there is, there is a traditional limit to tradi uh, for the explanations of those superlinear scaling coefficient because they are interpreted as a consequence of social networks and the, and the degree of connectedness, connectedness between social networks. And so the upper scaling coefficient there would be two if you have point by point interactions among individuals in the network. So what we then found in, in, in the parameters that describe the great acceleration, in particular, 
the socioeconomic one, we found a regime which we termed ultra linear scaling of scaling coefficients larger than two or even larger than three and a half, going all the way to 27 in some cases. What's going on here? Well, first of all, it's an interesting diagnosis, but uh, and we will get to the explanation of that in a moment. But once we sort of uncovered the, the dependency of the emergent phenomena to the individuals that act, whose behavior actually drives those phenomena, we could also find interesting interdependencies that can be looked at to understanding the, the dynamics of the coupled um, so, social earth system here. So look at CO2. So if you look at the scaling relationships of CO2 emissions scaled to populations on a decade by decade scale, you see it's uh, super linear. There are periods where it's almost linear. There are periods where it is le less than linear, sort of sublinear, and then it goes up again. So if you look at that behavior of global CO2 emission scale to population size, you can create a very detailed narrative about what actually the history of the last 70 years or so was vis-a-vis -vis, um, our production of greenhouse gases, for instance. And you can map economic shocks and other uh, external parameters onto this history. If we then look at what goes on with uh, the, co the CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere, we see the effects, the, the buffer effects of the Earth system. We see that those scale sublinear, but the worrisome trend is that the scaling coefficient goes up. And what that means is basically it's an indicator of our human activity exhausting the buffer capacity of the earth system to absorb uh, the CO2 that we put in, in a super linear scaling way uh, based on population size. So this is a clear diagnosis of an underlying mechanism. And you can of course perform all kinds of PL wise comparison and analysis given the data that we have. And by the way, I should mention that uh, that work is mainly performed by Derek, who is uh, a research faculty in the new school. Now, when we looked at what are the elements of this ultralinear scaling, then we realize uh, that those are actually elements that we can term as a new regulatory system that actually controls uh, the patterns of the great acceleration and is sort of the regulatory control system that governs what we would call the Anthropocene. And this regulatory control system has the main elements are related to knowledge production, technology, and finance. And why are those elements different than the traditional uh, social scaling parameters, which all sort of uh, hover around 1.15? Right, those do no longer depend on person-to-person -person social interactions in the network because those interactions have a limit of two. Those are basically parameters that you can put out there and then everybody can connect with it. So if you write a scientific publication, you, everybody can read it. It's not that you have to individually tell all of your collaborators your results. Uh, the same thing with finance, the same thing with technology. So what we see here are the, the driving forces of that behavior that accelerates uh, and sort of causes all the positive and negative uh, features of the Anthropocene. And so those are just illustrations about how you can get at the relationship between web of science as a indicator for knowledge production patterns or global foreign direct investments um, or global telecommunication, because of course it's the technology of telecommunication that enables this type of connectivity uh, beyond the point by point connections in a social network. Now, driving at here in our work is that there are close relationships between our understanding of biological evolution and our standing of the evolution of global futures or technological evolution. 
And what we are interested in are not just the normal patterns of small diversification and growth, but we are interested in what's called in biology, the major transitions. Now, there is a general result from a complex system theory as it relates to major transitions. And that means that commonly what drives a major transition is an increase in network connectivity in the system. So we could go in discussion at length into the basis for this, but take this as a result that has been established quite thoroughly in the study of major transitions in, bio, in biological evolution, and then ask what would be a metric that we can use given our, the data that we have to ascertain to what extent we see that increase in network connectivity. And so here you see the data for trade flows, bilateral trade flows. And clearly increase in trade means increase in network connectivity, which is sort of the, the regulatory structure and the phenotype of a major transcript, uh, transition. And here you see, if you look at it decade by decade, that uh, trade flows increased most dramatically, again, scale to population uh, size, in the 1990s. And then it sort of leveled off, but it still scales uh, uh, super linearly. Now, what that means in our interpretation of historical dynamics, that it was in the 1990s that a completely major transition in the world economic system actually took place. And as those of you who studied and read up on those things, that is the period of when the effects of deregulation on the one hand and globalization on the other hand were fully unleashed. And so what you, what you see here is basically kind of a phase transition of the global uh, trade system. And you can do the same thing with financial ex uh, exchanges, foreign investment and things like that. So those are the ways how we're trying to study uh, from a complex systems point of view, those historical transitions that are relevant uh, for intervening and designing global futures. Now, if you look at this then in parallel, uh, what you see here is that we can actually in, identify an isomorphism between our understanding of biological evolution and the evolution of global futures. And in terms of biological evolution, I'm talking here not about sort of the microdynamics of of Darwinian population, I'm talking about understanding major transitions in evolution. And those major transitions that actually explain the diversity of life are a consequence of the transformation of extended regulatory networks. I'll leave it at that. We can talk more about that in discussion if you, uh, if you want to know more about what that actually means. Now, we see the same thing in terms of the technological social systems um, that uh, make up basically our global, or that will determine our global future. We also see transformation of extended regulatory networks. Those then in not, don't include just genes and their regulatory context and their environment. They include such elements as the financial system, te technologies, um, the forced technological or knowledge revolution based on digitization. So we have to understand the interactions of those components. Similarly, as we have to understand, for instance, the interactions of the genome um, of a individual larvae and the social insect colony, for instance, that helps us understand the evolution of the superorganismal phenotype. And so uh, we can explain those features with a similar perspective of regulatory evolutionary change. Um, and the reason why we emphasize regulatory change here is also because in terms of uh, intervening in trajectories into global futures, we need to understand where the levers are, the regulatory levers that we could actually affect that system dynamics in a certain way. So that's basically the program uh, of that one axis uh, of the new dimensions of complexity from the past into the future. Now let's look at this in a concrete example. 
uh, a specific challenge of a, of a system transformation that we need to understand. And this is sort of the energy system. Now, this is a projection based on uh, several realistic model assumptions um, that were done by uh, a student uh, here at ASU, uh, I'm on her committee. She's uh, Hikaru Furukawa. She is in the School of Earth and Space Exploration. And so if you project the total energy usage uh, in exajoules um, of our human technological system, then depending on the model, but let's say by about 2070, we will basically exceed the energy need that the total land photosynthesis generates at any given year. And if you project those further into the future, uh, we might exceed global photosynthesis that includes aquatic photosynthesis um, sometimes in the next century. Now clearly that is not a feasible way if we try to meet our energy needs based on our current sources, namely uh, burning the products of past photosynthesis, fossil fuels. So that clearly just shows that um, we need a, an energy transition. We need a radical energy transition. That means a major transition and we need it fast. Now, if you put this in a longer time span of geological and evolutionary time, we actually realized that in the history of life on this planet, there were several energy transitions. The first one was geochemical energy. It was then with the invention of photosynthesis, a completely new ball game started. And we can talk about the details here. But photosynthesis produced oxygen, and that basically created the energy regime that we are currently still operating under, namely that we, on a very general level, the biosphere takes photons, translates them into electrons, which very quickly then get translated into molecules. And those molecules uh, are, then, are then built up as an energy storage on the one hand, and they are oxidized, that means burned in the mitochondria of all of our cells um, as the major source of energy. The interesting thing about the biosphere is that there is an input, namely photons, and the rest is a very circular system, uh, namely the circulation of various forms of, mole of molecular energy uh, carriers. Now that then accumulated and created reserves, which is the nice thing about molecules that you can actually store them, including in form of fossil fuels. Uh, there's a transition between oxygen and flesh as Olivia Judson, who is responsible for that paper and that graph, I uh, calls it because once you have oxygen, systems can get bigger and then you can basically consume larger chunks of energy by eating them then we have a digestive system, but ultimately the oxidation takes place in every one of our cells using the oxygen regime, basically reduction uh, of molecules. And uh, then we added the fire regime by figuring out that we can burn things, but again, we are burning the products of this original photosynthesis. And so this is a very unsustainable system. And uh, historians, uh, often say there were several energy transitions uh, in our recent history, sort of from, from wood to coal to oil and gas. Um, I recently polemicized against it and says we never left the Stone Age because the only thing that really changed is what we burned. Uh, we have not done anything really meaningful in terms of discovering a completely new and sustainable energy regime. Of course, there are two possibilities how we can do this. Um, nuclear energy is sort of a way out of this, but it is also it comes with its own problems. And of course, renewable energies. Renewable energies, mainly in terms of uh, solar and wind, are basically using the same basic uh, uh, original input as the biosphere does, 
because solar is directly harvesting photons and wind is basically a consequence um, of solar energy by basically you know, temperature gradients and then turbulence in the atmosphere. So it's ultimately also powered by the sun. So we have solar as the primary energy source that we need to harvest. So the challenge then becomes, how can we design an energy system uh, along the lines of the biosphere? Because why would we want to design it along the lines of the biosphere? Well, I would say 3.5 billion years of success. And uh, a challenge uh, that uh, we now are uh, actively engaged in, uh, in many discussions here has to do uh, with, do we want to use molecules or electrons as our primary energy carrier? And there is now a lot of discussions to electrify everything. This, of course, raises the challenges of storage. And the question is, can we sort of replay the biosphere? How much can we do with electricity? How much do we have to do with actually molecules again as energy carriers? The question is, how do we get the molecules? Can we produce molecules such as hydrocarbons uh, in a renewable and sustainable way uh, using solar energy and circular uh, circular economies of molecules, basically. Those are the kind of questions that we are addressing here from this evolutionary and complex systems point of view. So <clears throat> evolutionary foundations for global futures then uh, uh, involves that we want to study both historically evolutionary history, but with a special emphasis on the interplay between regulatory structures and niche construction, which we call extended evolutionary dynamics. We want to understand this, we want to model it, we focus on major transitions, and we want to use that as a guide for interventions, namely sort of trying to figure out what would be sustainable transitions of systems such as the energy system that are inspired from this evolutionary and complex systems point of view. And ultimately what, that, uh, what we are aiming for is a new scientific understanding of the dynamic of the human earth system. And so let's sort of look at this and I'm closing in a minute or so that we have some time for discussion, um, what that means for some select applied questions in the context of global futures. Issues that we are studying within the school, the role of institutions and their evolution the role of capital and finance, the role and evolution of knowledge. So what kind of regulatory structure does knowledge have and information have in those systems? And what is the knowledge we need for global futures? Uh, the assessment and integration of technologies uh, by looking at it as part of an evolving complex systems along the lines of how we understand um, phenotypic evolution and the evolution of the biosphere. The evolution of norms, collective decisions and societal will, because that is how we have to get into that, not simple mapping assumption, but complex systems. Those are the elements of, the, of, the glo of, of societies that make up global futures. How are they actually interacting and behaving and how are, is their mind and their rules of behavior shaped? Because unless we understand this, uh, we will not succeed in uh, engineering or determining sustainable transformations into the future. And of course, many more. So in order for this to work and to sort of accomplish something with both the European Union and the new administration here promised to do, namely major transformations of the system towards a sustainable um, energy, climate, economic, social justice, you know, and you name it system, we need to manage this transition and we need to manage it fast, coming back to this problem of the complexity crisis with the time window of interventions rapidly shrinking. So we need some new technologies there. We need technologies such as the decision theater, which we are currently uh, redesigning as part of global futures and with a more specific complex system framework and this is just an example of a decision theater event uh, in Berlin, why we will still be able to travel. Um, now, what that means is uh, 
what, where are we going from there? What is the vision of complexity within global futures? And so on the very high end, we can say what complex system science does for global futures, it can provide a unified evolutionary perspective or a theoretical foundation of the complex human natural systems and their transformations. That's the important thing. We're focusing on the transformations. Uh, we want to understand the mechanisms that govern the behavior and dynamics of these complex systems. And we have done that at ASU in multiple forms uh, for quite some time now. And what we want to add to this is a specific focus on the failures. When do those dynamics break down? And I need to remind anybody what, so, uh, about the recent and ongoing circus in Washington DC about the display of such a failure. And uh, based on those uh, insights, what we want to focus on are uh, interventions and options for global futures uh, in order to avoid that complexity crisis that I talked about. And the illustration of the energy system is just one among many uh, that we are trying to study in that context. So that then gets us to some diagrammatic vision about what the School of Complex Adaptive System does within uh, global futures. Um, it, uh, we have here uh, on, the, on the theoretical level, we have some guiding principles, evolution, scale, function, behavior, and all those uh, complex systems terms that we're interested in. Uh, they, of course, inform modeling as well as uh, the acquisition and generation of the right kind of data so that we can integrate that to form a theoretical basis for global future. And then applying that basis uh, in terms of scenarios, interventions, and solutions. So that basically, in a nutshell, is the vision uh, for the new school illustrated with some examples. And I leave it at that. And Derek, you have monitored the chat. Do we have any questions? Uh, we do not at this moment. Okay. Do we have questions? I think you have to use the, the, the chat function because that's the way those webinars work. It's the Q&A, not the chat. Oh, the Q&A, okay. Thank you, Trish. Please. How very unacademic. Anything going on in the Q&A? Uh, nothing, nothing yet. Well, if there are no questions, uh, I think then uh, we don't have to sit here and stare at the screen waiting for that. Uh, you all know how to uh, find me in the virtual world. And uh, with that, uh, oh, there is one. Oh, we, yeah. Can you see that? Um, can you bring up the slide of research questions again? I can try. What did I do now? I shouldn't have opened that. Answer live. Um, okay. How do I get rid of this? Okay, here I can close it. Okay, so let's see. How can I go back here? That one? Uh, yes, that's the one. Okay, this is sort of very, uh, very much a short selection of questions that we are trying to do. And it is also based on uh, ongoing work that uh, various research centers uh, at ASU that were devoted to complex systems have been doing. And it is directed towards some of the central questions within the Global Futures Laboratory. But uh, as I said, this is a list that needs to be greatly uh, expanded, and I could, but uh, you, it gives you an idea about the kind of research challenges that we are going to pursue. So for instance, uh, 
if you take the first one, the role of institutions and their evolution, ever since, uh, you know, uh, ASU's relationship with Lynn Ostrom and, uh, and, and Marco Janssen and Marty Anderis and others who are working in, tra in that uh, tradition, uh, focus on the commons and the evolution of institutions and what are the right kind of institution and the right kind of environment to uh, successfully govern uh, and resolve problems has been a major research focus. We are focusing in terms of building up an emphasis on complexity economics, also on the role of capital and finance. I can give you an example. If you look at the energy transition, it has been calculated that the energy trend to accomplish the energy transition will require about um, around 80 to 100 trillion dollars over a period of uh, 30 to 50 years. Now, if you uh, saw what was mobilized right now in terms of dealing, or not really dealing, of trying to deal with the uh, effects of the pandemic, where the US alone has so far marshaled $4 trillion in new debt within a year and soon to add, be added another two. Um, and then the European Union doing its thing and things like that. So capital is not the problem. It can be created. The question is what are the kind of investment strategies and vehicles that you need to do to direct this uh, to finance that uh, transitions into a, a, a renewable uh, energy system. So there are huge opportunities, but it also re requires us to uh, anticipate some of the consequences which requires a modeling of complex dynamics of financial systems and things like that. Okay, so, so we have another question here. Um, is there a certificate in CAS that the school offers, correct? Can I take that in parallel to my PhD program? Do you know if it is to be paid separately in terms of tuition? So right now, we are, this is all very much in flux because the school exists uh, for about half a year and the university bureaucracy timescales are much more glacial than that. So a variety of, uh, of academic offerings are currently being prepared and make their way through the bureaucracy. What exists currently is a complex adaptive system certificate in about seven or eight different PhD programs. And there it is basically uh, an application process. And then it's sort of part of your normal um, course offerings because then you work with, uh, with Michael Barton in particular who runs all those educational programs to figure out what courses you have to take to get the certificate attached to your uh, degree. So that already exists. We, are, we will be building specific freestanding CAS certificates for undergraduate and graduate levels. But as I said, there is a, that's the opposite of a, that, that's temporal scaling increase, namely dealing with university bureaucracies. That's, the, that, that's another crisis. What if the time scales are too long? But it, it's, it's coming online in the near future. And Michael Barton uh, posted that uh, you can email him about this um, if you want more information. Yes. Any questions about the programs, please get in touch with Michael who knows everything. So we have a few other questions here. Um, do you face resistance from institutions or domain specific scientists in the pursuit of intentional development, um, evolution, transformation? As you mentioned earlier, the angel of history, science has been a past gazing paradigm. Yes, uh, the answer is uh, yes. And of course that's nothing new, but on the other hand, I think uh, this is a reason why uh, this first comprehensive school of complex adaptive systems emerged at ASU and even at ASU we needed to have the context of a completely new college and a completely new uh, endeavor such as the Global Futures Laboratory to realize it. Um, because we, and that just shows you that even an institution as progressive as ASU, it's not 
the easiest way to build this up. But on the other hand, uh, that is mainly a problem on the institutional level because we never had any problem on the level of individual collaborators from domain specific sciences uh, to get engaged and excited uh, about complex systems research questions. So uh, this is the classical example where the individuals are much more open than their institutional constraining forces of departments and colleges and administrators. So uh, insofar as we are talking also about the role of institutions, that means also the role of institutional redesign of universities. So uh, in that sense, uh, this is sort of one part of the answer. The other part uh, to really to think more specifically about uh, the future rather than the past, uh, this is an epistemological challenge uh, where traditionally uh, we have developed a, a theoretical and a modeling environment where we look at dynamical systems, we standardize the system based on the data that we have on the, uh, uh, about the past, and then we just extrapolate. But if you think about what one of the main technique of complex adaptive system science, namely agent-based modeling allows you to do, it basically allows us to create more generative possibilities about the future. So that's already a formal technique that is more geared towards the openness of the future rather than the closeness of the past. So, you know, it's a, it's really a paradigm shift that is ongoing right now. And we are hoping to sort of speed up that transition also in terms of the paradigm shift. Okay, so our next question is, there was mention of needing new mathematics targeting complexity. It is helpful to know a little about this. An example uh, of a problem uh, that might be difficult to formulate using existing computationally based mathematics. Yes, so that was in the context of, uh, of how to actually create formal description of this uh, of from the past into the future. And so what we currently have, we are getting an increasing uh, number of detailed uh, time series data uh, on many different dimensions. And from that, there is, we have an ongoing research project between ASU, the Santa Fe Institute and mathematicians in Europe about how can we actually model those, the, uh, those historical processes with a framework of, uh, of stochastic equations uh, in order to then infer possible underlying mechanisms from the analysis of those time series data. So again, that would be a, a very would take longer than we have. So whoever it is, get in touch with me and we can talk at length and I can send you some manuscripts and, and, and where we are with this. But it, it is something where, especially if you move beyond a first order Markov process, which you have to do if you have very complex interconnected time series, uh, where the mathematics currently is not yet fully there that allows us to do this in an easily operational way. So those are research projects uh, that, are, that are relevant for this. And you know, to give you an example, uh, it's also an interesting diagnostic tool because if you analyze a time series that way, um, if you then find that the, that you would be way off what would be an expected probability of the next state in the time series, uh, then you know that either your assumption about the underlying stochastic process are incomplete, so you have hidden variables, or you have external uh, effects that have, uh, that greatly influence the dynamics of the system. And we are working together with people from archaeology and history who have created an incredibly detailed data set, a so-called Cheshut data set, um, about sort of civilizations and polities, and fine-tuning those methods in the analysis of those uh, data sets. One example, for instance, to the kind of research that you, new insights that you get. If you, we looked at this Sasha data set, it, it was, it, 
people ran a or collaborators ran a principal component analysis. It was very effective. We then looked at the relationship in a complex systems framework between principal component one and two, and we could actually then come up with a formal model that organizes the growth of civilization that goes like this. So first you have complexity parameters that have to do with mainly infrastructure, and that allows a civilization to grow to a point. Then it generally enters a period of stasis. There are, there's the principal component two factors are ones that have to do with the information processing capacity of a society. Once they basically increase to a certain degree, then the, then the civilization starts growing again. So those are the kind of insights that you can get with this type of mathematics. But again, we, that would be a conversation probably offline to talk more about this. How do you spell that data set real quick, Mumford? Sheshat, S-H-E-T-A-T. -T. Okay, and now we have another question here. How do you envision the work of the complexity initiative integrating more into the decision theater? This is, there's currently a task force that is operating that uh, is uh, restructuring uh, the decision theater as part of global futures. And uh, here a lot has to do with what type of additional modeling strategies do we have to have if we want to use the decision theater not just as a problem solving tool for well-defined problems, which is what it is right now. So right now the decision theater operates that we have a concrete challenge that can be turned into models based on the data that we have. And then you bring in the, the, the stakeholders in order to explore the consequences of different interventions or different decisions. But the problem is very much defined. For global futures, uh, what we need to develop is the decision theater as, a, as kind of a heuristic tool uh, to uh, envision larger and more complex problems so that we can get scenarios into the future that are not just well-defined problems with a practical solution. And that then uh, requires two things. It requires the kind of reorientation that uh, we are trying to accomplish with this, with this new school. And on a technical uh, level, it requires that we create what computer scientists call a domain-specific language for decision processes so that we actually have the formal tools to create to turn the decision theater into a heuristic so that those are some of the uh, elements that are being now uh, you know set in motion as part of the fact that the decision theater is now also part of global futures okay um our next question is recognizing the foundation of complex science, system science and systems theory and its engagement with evolutionary theory beyond institutions like norms, behaviors and collective action. How do other frames like power and culture enter into complex system science? I mean, power and culture, I think that those are important, uh, you know, concepts that one needs to operationalize beyond the metaphoric in order to sort of treat them as emergent properties of those that, that govern the behavior of those systems. So, you know, in that sense, there is a lot of interesting modeling work being done, particularly in the analysis of network uh, that uh, try to uncover the dynamics of sort of power relations and you can put it with strengths and connectivity of networks and things like that. So that is a way to formalize it. Culture, I think, is, uh, is a very interesting thing because I'm working on that uh, in some elements of culture in our uh, computational study of the evolution of knowledge systems, for instance. And again, the important thing here is that that perspective allows us to create uh, a more formalized understanding of the insights that those traditional social science and humanities perspectives have revealed in order to, again, going back to this problem of the uh, 
uh, of the mapping between uh, the microstates and the macrostates. So one of the examples I had in there uh, was Robert Schiller's uh, new approach, what he calls narrative economics. And what that basically recognizes is that, uh, you know, e economics is, is or the economy is a consequence of the action of individuals. So we need to figure out what guides the actions of individuals. And Schiller could demonstrate very well that individuals are not just rational actors, the way standard economic theory predicts, but that they are guided by what we would refer to as their cultural milieu, uh, mainly as Schiller pointed out, guiding narratives that influence behavior. And so he is trying to do using some similar, and I might say still less sophisticated techniques than we do in trying to get at uncovering the role of those guiding narratives that characterize, let's say a particular time. And what was the narrative that got America out of the Great Depression, for instance, and he could sort of look into newspapers, into novels, into elements of culture, and then say, well, once that narrative took hold, then it influenced the behavior of the individuals, which in turn influenced the emergent properties of economic output, for instance. And that's the way we are operating with those categories that you pointed out are extremely important. All right, thank you for that. Um, uh, one more question here we have, uh, is there a minimum number of components in a, in a complex system? Well, you know, <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's a good question, uh, too, basically. But, uh, you know, of course, you, uh, ironically, you could say even one, if you think about that, we all are remotely schizophrenic and sort of have our own complex systems dynamics. But, you know, the, 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 the issue with complex systems is, of course, um, joking aside, uh, that um, everything we looked at is, it's, it's always networks all the way down. So, you know, what is an individual or a, a, a part in one system is of course generally composed of many components itself which then interact in a complex system way so it becomes often an interesting measurement problem uh, how to identify what the unit of those systems what, what the, how to identify the units that make up those systems so it becomes a very central question of abstractions. But I think you, once you have two people uh, or two individuals, you can already get complex interactions. OK. Um, are the regulatory systems, in lay terms, the relational terms or relational dynamics between domains? Yes. I think that's a very fair description. Okay, I think that's all we have right now. Well, that was uh, a quite uh, a good number of questions. And I think we are, uh, you know, it's now 15 after the hour. So I thank everybody who still could be with us uh, and didn't have to jump to the inevitable next Zoom meeting. Uh, so in that sense, thanks. And please come back in two weeks where we have the next talk in that series. And you've got some people in the queue.